just a few seconds before I start my intro, uh, but glad to see so many of you joining us already. Hello, and welcome to another Readsy Live, our ongoing series of webinars where we bring on professionals from the world of publishing uh, to teach you uh, how to write and publish better books. Uh, this week, today, uh, we're having the next of our first line frenzies. Uh, it's uh, my favorite recurring uh, segment we have. It's one of the only recurring segments we have, but uh, it's become my favorite. Uh, in which uh, Rebecca Heyman, one of our long-standing editors, comes on uh, and reviews first lines of stories submitted by you, the authors. Uh, anyone who registered through Eventbrite would have got a link where they could have uh, sent in the first lines of their story or novel. Uh, I've got them all here on the list. Um, if you haven't submitted it yet, I'm afraid it's too late. Uh, we have to cut it off somewhere. We've already had over 1,600 submissions, so uh, uh, needless to say, we're not going to get through all of them just today, but thank you so much. Uh, there's some really great here today. Uh, so uh, if yours isn't chosen, uh, please don't take it as any sort of criticism or judgment. Uh, we're just looking for uh, a good variety of uh, first lines for us to uh, just be able to show everyone uh, some of the principles behind writing a great effective first line. Uh, so before Becca comes in, I see everyone's uh, saying where they're from. Fantastic. Glad to see so many folks, uh, not only from the States, which we normally get, and Europe, but uh, notice we have a few people from India and uh, further east as well. Some from Singapore I saw. Thank you for waking up or staying up so early. Uh, glad you can make it. Uh, hopefully this will be uh, totally worth it. They're always a lot of fun. Uh, and uh, I have no doubt you'll learn something that you didn't know before. Uh, it's coming up to 6 o'clock where I am, 1 p.m. over on the East Coast, 10 a.m. in the West Coast. Uh, I'm just going to give it another minute before I bring Becca on uh, and we'll get this thing started. As I said, we had uh, over 1,600 submissions, and sadly we can't get to all of them. But uh, once again, uh, Becca has kindly uh, agreed to join up with me in the next couple of weeks to record a few more of these on uh, offline uh, that we'll be posting. Last time we posted them to YouTube, uh, but this time uh, we're going to post them up on Instagram, the exciting world of IGTV. Uh, I'm going to post a link to our Instagram feed, uh, but you can find it in the description for this video as well. If you follow us there, uh, you'll get a notification when we record those. We're going to try and get through maybe 30, 40, hopefully, first lines in this session, um, but we'll probably get to probably a similar number in those follow-ups as well. So uh, make sure you follow us on Instagram, and uh, while we wait for Becca's come on, uh, I'm sad to say this, uh, but smash the like button and make sure you're subscribed. Uh, we do loads of these um, webinars on YouTube uh, every other week, uh, and if you want to be the first to find out about it, uh, just follow us right here on YouTube, uh, plus Shailen uh, uh, on our team, who's a YouTuber herself, puts out a new video twice a week, and they're always worth watching. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, before Becca comes on, actually, no, I'll bring her on. There's a few. There's one thing I need to tell you before we properly start, uh, but why not? Uh, Please, ladies and gentlemen, uh, help me welcome Rebecca Faith Heyman, uh, who'll be joining us just now. Rebecca, how are you? I am great. How are you? Yeah, not bad. Uh, it's been a couple of months since we did the last of these. We are still, well, I I'm still effectively in lockdown. How are you? Uh, still, you know, still in lockdown. Things are really beautiful here in New England, as you can see uh, behind me. So uh, things are starting to ease up a little bit on outdoor activities, and hopefully um, we'll be able to sort of just get out, which is so important uh but you know hanging on hanging in and healthy and safe so very grateful for all of those things like uh, really grateful also for everyone tuning in uh, as you'll notice uh, i put on a collared shirt for the first time in a couple of months so i'm really making an effort for everyone uh, at home um, i appreciate it personally <laughs> I, I make some small effort i you know i i'll tell you i'm still wearing shorts but i made an effort <laughs> with the shirt um okay uh i'm going to just crack on with this uh, as I mentioned before, we had so many submissions, so apologies if we're unable to get through uh, to your one. I also forgot uh, in the first version of the form I set up to have a little field where you could put the name of your book or story. I added that towards the end, so uh, I don't have a lot of people's um, titles. So if I call out your name uh, during this, uh, just get on the comments and tell us what the name of your story is, and then we'll be able to share it at the end. Again, uh, Becca's going to go into this absolutely cold. Uh, actually, Becca, before we start, uh, can you tell us a bit about yourself? <laughs> yes, yes. Um, eventually, we're going to like reach a momentum peak where we don't have to do the bio every time. But um, for those of you new to First Line Frenzy, I just want to say welcome and thanks for being here. Um, 
I have been a freelance book editor since uh, 2007-ish, 2009-ish, uh, depending on you know when I really went pro or started my own business. Regardless, it's been a while. Uh, I mostly help authors prior to query, though I also help some authors who are working through notes from agents or editors, uh, you know, publishers, things like that. Um, you know, I, I work in mostly adult fiction, some YA. Um, I love romance and lit fic and just contemporary fiction. And uh, I do a lot of historical as well. So um, my approach is very honest, uh, but I hope very compassionate and I hope you will have a lot of fun. I have not seen any of these first lines, uh, which is of course part of the fun of all this. And, you know, I'm ready to go. All right, let's start off with the very first one. Let me know if you can see this. I can. My <laughs> it doesn't seem as small this time. Last time I was like squinting. Okay. Um, this is a public service announcement. Do not bother the actress. She's taking a break from flashing cameras and nosy journalists. So this um, feels really voicey and really current. Um, I I'm not sure what the context is, whether this is supposed to be a kind of social media post or if this is a more intimate confessional style of novel. Uh, but I think this feels really, um, really welcoming despite being told that this uh, actress is taking a break. It feels like we're being brought in sort of behind the curtain and that's a really nice feeling. So I think this is really successful. Does this happen to be romance or women's fiction, Martin? Uh, you know? No, this is, you want to know it's a thriller. Really? Yeah. Okay, that that shocks me, right? Usually we can feel um, uh, feel thriller right away, uh, but this definitely feels a little more uh, women's thick rom com to me. So um, whether or not that's the right tone at the outset is obviously, we can't tell that from a single line. But either way, I think it's a really intriguing line and certainly one that draws me in. Okay, uh, that was from the author H.F.N. Miller. Thank you for sending that one in. Uh, it, it was a, a thriller. Okay, uh, next one here. A bright constellation boomed over the Lone Star State for a moment and was lost. So I think this must mean fireworks, right? A bright constellation, because constellations otherwise don't boom. Uh, boomed over the Lone Star State for a moment and was lost. Hmm. You know, Texas is very big. And uh, I am more interested in the specifics of where in Texas we are. Uh, I'm not especially keen on these kind of uh, nicknames for states, right? Like no one in New York calls it the Big Apple. You know, do you know this? So, um, I almost feel like this is already an outsider's perspective and we always wanna be on the inside, generally. So I, I might like to see a bright constellation boomed over you know, small town Texas for a moment uh, and was lost or for a moment before it was lost. Um, but this is something, this is an interesting image and I think it could be a little more specific, but it's good. We've got an interesting comment uh, here from Jennifer. She would say she changed boom to bloom. Kind of well, if it's a firework, then we want to evoke the sound, right? Um, and I think there's something interesting about a constellation being something that is relatively silent, right? Uh, stars don't make noise that we can hear anyway. Uh, and then the idea of this loud noise. So I, I'm not necessarily opposed to that. Bloom still works, absolutely. But if you're going for that more sensory um, feedback in the line, then I think bloom is probably the right choice. Uh, but again, I'm just presupposing that this is fireworks. It could, I could be totally wrong. Uh, okay, that was uh, from Matt Harvey. Uh, sorry, I didn't uh, call your name out first. Uh, but the next one, uh, we have, uh, I think, very similar imagery uh, is from Michael Lines. Uh, so if you are here, uh, let us know the title of this piece. A single candle sputters, its light flickering across the parchment, where I transcribe these secrets I dare not share with anyone except you. Hmm. This is also very intriguing. There's a lot of drawing in here, right? We're really being invited uh, sort of to stand whisper close and hear this story. Um, you know, the immediacy of first person present tense can be 
too intense for some readers, we often see first person present tense in YA because uh, YA is always looking for that strong hit of emotional feedback and emotional immediacy. Um, so this already feels like it could get, it could really ramp up the intensity at times, which maybe is fine. Uh, what's the genre on this one? Uh, it is uh, an historical mystery. Yeah, I love that feeling. I think this, that feels right on message uh, for what this is. And, and in that case, I would say that first person present tense is going to give us an opportunity to build dramatic tension because we can only know what our narrator knows. So I, I think this is, uh, this is lovely. Yeah, I love it. Cool. Uh, all right. The next one. People saw me as the grim reaper of relationships. So this violates my no generalization rule. I don't really care what people saw the narrator as. I really care about what a specific person saw the narrator as or um, how the narrator sees him or herself. So I, I would also, you know, what does that actually mean, right? If the Grim Reaper is a herald of death, what does that mean to relationships? Does that mean that this person kind of comes in and destroys relationships? Um, and how and why and is it intentional? So I think this is the seed of a good idea that needs more development. Uh, I think you're on the right lines. That was Janae Smith, uh, and it's a romance novel. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, so it, then I guess the question becomes, it, if if she's constantly destroying other people's relationships, that might be a little bit of characterization problem. But then if she, if she tries to be in these relationships and they always end, uh, I guess it calls into question why does. Uh, yeah, I, I'm I'm confused by this. So again, I think the idea is probably good, but it needs to be teased out with a lot more specificity and, and maybe a little more um, thought about how these words are going to be interpreted and, and what the implications are. You're relying on something very familiar, a very familiar image. Um, and so what, how, how are your readers going to digest that in the context of the sentence that you've given us? And, and I think there's a little too much ambiguity here for that to be done very effectively. Thank you. Uh, that was from Janae Smith. Uh, the next one is from Erwin E. Schneidzins. Uh, Congratulations on picking up one of the lightest tool bags in your life to help lift your heaviest challenges towards success. Okay. Uh, so uh, my guess is that this is nonfiction self-help. Uh, this is very, very clever, very charming. Um, but we don't lift challenges towards success. So I will note that in, in common practice, uh, American English does not add an S to directional cues such as toward, forward, backward, et cetera. Um, but UK and, and authors in, in other parts of the world do. So that's not a mistake. Um, but if you are an, an, a US or American um, author, you may want to consider taking that S away. So we don't lift challenges toward success. And that's where the sentence is breaking down. You know, we don't want to be so um, in love with our buzzwords that we lose meaning. Uh, so I would rethink that. Um, we lift our heaviest challenges toward what or over what the, the proposition is not quite working for me here. Uh, so I would, with the exception of those last two words in the sentence, this is really nice. Just give it a little bit more refinement. Hey, thank you, Erwin. Uh, okay, next one here is from uh, Michael Wright. Uh, Michael, if you're here, uh, hello, and uh, let us know what the title of this is. Uh, Jacob Kagan loved winter when the sun set early and a sea of lights glowed brightly in Berlin's shop windows. I like this. It's fairly innocuous, right? This doesn't, it, 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 it's efficient. Right, we know where we are. We know what time of year it is. So great job activating the setting. But is this the most important thing that we should see at the very beginning of your book? Um, this really feels like a second or third sentence in the first paragraph. But this doesn't um, this doesn't activate our character. Only the setting. And uh, as 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 often as I'm asking for first lines to do a lot of heavy lifting, that's what I'm talking about, right? Just the setting is not enough. We need to activate our character a little bit more here. So I'd like to know more about Jacob straight off the bat. 
Okay, uh, that was from, thank you, Michael, for telling us, uh, a historical fiction set in World War II called Beyond the Tracks. Ignore my giant bucket of water. <laughs> <laughs> well, in America, everything is bigger. Well, it's 64 ounces because it's bigger than my head. Uh, because if I don't fill it up at the beginning of the day, I just forget to drink water all day. So this is, you can't ignore something that huge, really, on, the, on my desk. Okay. Uh, I've got a next one from Akila Fala. Uh, Akila, if you are here, uh, let me know. Here's your first line. At the train station, she stood on the platform and everything appeared blurry since her eyes were an ocean of tears whose waves couldn't stop rolling. Uh, this feels like a first draft sentence to me, which is to say there's a, there's a strong image here, girl on train tracks crying her face off, um, but the execution is clunky and it's inefficient. So um, at the train station, she stood on the platform. She stood on the platform at the train station or she stood at the train station platform. So, um, this sentence stretches out really simple ideas instead of, um, you know, more concisely stating what is obvious or clear. Um, this probably also needs to be two sentences. I, I would also even consider bringing this blurriness, um, smushing basically the entire top line of the sentence together. Um, you know, the oncoming, from where she stood on the platform, the oncoming train, you know, looked like a collage of metal and steam or whatever. I don't know when this is. Is there steam? I don't know. Um, uh, and then, you know, move on to sentence two, uh, you know, that she's crying and all this stuff. So I just think this lacks some artfulness. Uh, get in there with your descriptive language and your beautiful, thoughtful sentences and make that a little bit more interesting and dynamic. Awesome. Uh, can't tell precisely what the genre is, but uh, it was a short story. Thank you, Akila, uh, for sending that one in. Here's our next one. So a little bit on the shorter side. I sit in the Miami airport, MIA. I can't tell if MIA is supposed, supposed to be the airport abbreviation or if it means missing in action. So I don't actually know what the sentence means, and that's a problem. I think it's like uh, a bit of both, right? <laughs> well, I mean, I'm like tempted, obviously, to Google. I know the Orlando code, um, and I know, and uh, I know the. Um, oh, Miami is MIA. It is. It is MIA. Okay, did somebody say that? I I don't watch the public comments while I'm doing this because I would be so distracted by this like endless conversation being had. So, okay, I sit in the Miami airport, MIA. So maybe this has a double meaning. Um, that this person is escaping and missing in action, or this is just further clarification of where they are. Either way, um, it's not terribly effective. This is not an interesting, like I sit at my desk chair. Uh, you know, this is not a, a compelling image to bring us uh, into the narrative. So I would, uh, again, uh, go up, fast forward me five minutes into this manuscript and then see what kind of lines there are there. And, and that might be the right place to start. Okay, fantastic. Uh, here's your that one. Uh, sorry, that one uh, was from Alexa Maxwell uh, from a memoir. So imagine she herself has been to Miami Airport. Uh, Great. Thank you, Alexa. Here's your next one. OJ lifted his head at the wrong moment and made eye contact with the prettiest girl he had ever seen. That's very charming. Um, yeah, this is very, very sweet, very charming. I assume it's either YA or middle grade. Can we confirm? Uh, no. No? No. It's adult? It's an adult thriller. Okay. So uh, mm, girls are generally under the age of 12. Uh, women are adults who are featured as <laughs> objects of beauty in adult novels. Uh, Personal pet peeve of mine, uh, you know, women are women, girls are girls, teens are teens. Please use specific language for uh, objects of affection, right? This is an important thing. Uh, we, we don't need to make women's lives more difficult by constantly calling them girls. So, and look, look at the confusion. I assumed that if you're talking about a pretty girl, uh, you must be writing YA or middle grade. So. 
I, I, I think this is a very charming time to bring us in. I think this is a lovely, um, there's just a nice lightness about this sentence, but if she's a woman, call her a woman. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. Like judging by what we've seen in the um, comments, I think whenever you name a character OJ, especially at the beginning, everyone so, thinks OJ Simpson. I was gonna mention that, but then I thought maybe I'm filtering too much through you know, my American consciousness. I, of course, remember the O.J. Simpson trial, and this is now a huge part of uh, you know, culture everywhere. So it, it's true, but it's also not fair to say that you know, one bad apple ruins the bunch. So I, I, I would probably point this out to an author um, if I were editing this and maybe encourage them to give us the full name, like Oscar James or whatever it is, if there is a full name uh, first and then bring us into the abbreviated name second, but there could be other reasons for that. So I, I don't want to make a blanket statement about that. All right, that was a, uh, an adult thriller from Ralph Kampanong. Thank you, Ralph, for, for sending that one in. Here's, uh, actually at this point, uh, might take a quick break, Becca, as uh, you, had a, you had something you wanted to share. Yes, yes, yes. I um, would like to personally ask everybody watching this, to help in the effort, I, uh, the hashtag trending on Twitter right now is called Blackout Bestseller List. And it's really an effort to recognize um, Black authors for their incredible work and sort of giving uh, more of our attention to Black artists who are often ignored. And so I've put together a list of recommend recommendations for you of um, some of my favorite books uh, by Black authors, most of them very recent or current, because the idea is to really flood the bestseller list, and that requires us to look at contemporary literature. Um, so I have some recommendations that I'm going to run through. And Martin, are you posting the link somewhere? I already posted it in there. So amazing. So um, before I get to these titles, Martin just posted a link to a bookshop.org. Um, affiliate site that I set up. So I set it up just for this call. Basically, it's all the books I'm going to mention. Um, if you use our link to buy those books, uh, I will receive a 10% commission and all of the proceeds from that list will be donated to Black Visions Collective. So if you are trying to um, you know, help in this effort to black out bestseller lists, the, the ask is that you purchase two books by black authors this week, if you are able to do so. And so I have uh, my recommendations for you that I'm gonna run through now. Um, and of course there are a ton uh, more books to choose from, but I just made my list of what's been sort of on my mind lately. So um, the only other thing I'll say before I start is that there are a, a, there's a huge number of nonfiction books right now about being an anti-racist and about fighting uh, racism and, and I, say to you wholeheartedly, please read those books. But I also want you to recognize that um, black art touches every genre. And so I have recommendations in romance, uh, literary fiction, uh, contemporary fiction, nonfiction, and sci-fi fantasy. So, so whatever genre you like, um, you can find a black author to support. And so this is my quick list. Uh, Not the Girl You Marry by Andy J. Christopher. I just read it last weekend. Um, it, it's brand new. It's not brand new. Maybe brand new. It kind of just got on my radar. No, it's been out for a while. It's really charming. It's about a slightly abrasive um, protagonist, and she's really trying to find a way to be herself and be seen in relationships, and I really liked that. Um, Get a Life, Chloe Brown by Talia Hibbert came out, I believe, last year. The second in series comes out next week um, on the 23rd. And what I love about Get a Life, Chloe Brown, uh, Chloe has fibromyalgia. She's a plus sized black woman. Um, there's tons of representation in this book. And one of the best parts of this book is that our hero has a really compelling, dynamic, and complex backstory uh, that he works through over the course of um, over the course of the novel, and I, I really loved that. Uh, in literature, I have An American Marriage by Tiari Jones, which was breathtaking, and the audio is fantastic. Home Going by Yaa Jesse. Um, Yaa Jesse is coming out with her second book later this year, and she is an exquisite author. I mean, Home Going is far and away one of the best novels I've ever read, um, so please pick that one up. Uh, and I just last month, or earlier this month, time has no meaning, uh, read The Underground Railroad by Colson Whitehead. And it was um, 
just really stunning and 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 uh, at times very difficult to read, but also incredibly compelling and important. Uh, in nonfiction, like I said, there's a ton of nonfiction on the bestseller list right now. We want to keep it there. But if you haven't read Between the World and Me by Tana Hissy Coates, you must. Um, it it opened my eyes to the black experience in America in a way that nothing prior to that book ever had. And, um, you know, touched my heart in a way that I think I'll, I'll never forget for the rest of my life. Um, Hunger by Roxane Gay. Uh, Roxane is an incredible author. You could pick anything from her backlist uh, and I think you'll be happy with it. But Hunger is a really moving, um, a moving study about living in, it's a very embodied text. It's very much about what it's like to live in her body. And I think that's an extraordinary accomplishment. One of the best reads so far for me of 2020 is Such a Fun Age by Kylie Reed. Um, this is an incredible and very timely um, look at the relationship between a white family and um, the young black nanny that takes care of their child. And there's a sort of social media incident around this family and around this nanny and this book is about what happens next. It's amazing. And finally, uh, if you are a sci-fi and fantasy reader, I probably don't need to tell you this, uh, but the Broken Earth trilogy by N.K. Jemisin uh, has obviously been beloved for some time. Uh, but if you haven't picked up her work yet now, absolutely is the moment you can buy. Um, the box set, I believe, is what's on the bookshop.org list, but you can obviously buy these books one at a time as well. Uh, the first one is the fifth season. So that's my list. I tried to do that quickly, um, but I, I hope that you will all participate in this. Uh, again, please purchase if you can um, two books uh, by black authors this week. Um, it's this sort of effort started last Saturday and ends this Saturday. So we're really trying to um, sort of show the world that uh, we, we love and cherish our black authors and artists. So I hope you will join me in that. Amazing, thanks. Yes. Uh, Becca. There's like most of those I haven't read, like a uh, uh, N.K. Jemison series is one that I've been meaning to get onto for such a long time. I yeah, hey, buy them now. You can read them whenever, just buy them this week. So. That's true. Uh, I'll, get, I'll get the Kindle one. Hopefully that doesn't sort of affect <laughs> it negatively. Um, no, no, Kindle sales are, uh, ebook sales count. And I think, I don't know how, um, on bookshop.org it, it will take you to an ebook um, option if you if you're not interested in hard copies uh, on my list is all hard copies but you do whatever you can do uh, and feel comfortable doing um, if for whatever reason you can't purchase these books please get on a wait list for them at your local library um, you know see what you can do just to to let the world know that we value these voices and that we will read them uh, if they're if they're produced Amazing. Thank you so much. Uh, just uh, let everyone know we're going to cram through as many of these as we can. We said we're going to try to get up to, to 40 or so. Uh, All right. But, we'll go uh, fast. We'll yeah, go quick. We'll go fast-ish. But as I mentioned before, we're going to do uh, a few more of these on Instagram. So uh, hit the description for this video and uh, follow us on Instagram, and you'll be able to see a bunch more of these if uh, yours wasn't pulled up. Uh, okay. Thank you very much. Our next one here comes from uh, Alice Jean. <sighs> Okay. My first summer in Georgia, I'm cycling back from the beach up Route 80, sweating through my dress in the 95 degree heat. Uh, always remember that between the tens place and the ones space, we need a hyphen 95, should be hyphenated. Um, it's, I'm confused by when that, where and when the narrator is, right? So is this a, um, is this, currently the first summer in Georgia. Uh, so it's my first summer in Georgia and I'm cycling back from the beach up Route 80 or is this a memory of that first summer in Georgia? So I always like to establish quickly where in time the narrator stands, right? How close is the narrator to the events um, that are being explored in the book? So I'd like a little bit of clarity on that. But I like this, it's it's evocative. We, we're getting heat, we're getting a feeling, right? We're getting that sort of oppressive uh, 
Georgia humidity. <laughs> I've spent some time in the South, not a lot, but I do remember the kind of suffocating heat. So I would say even tease that out a little bit more. Uh, sweating through your dress is one thing, but really dig into your arsenal of descriptive language to bring that heat to life because it's such uh, an important characterizing effect of this setting. Cool. Uh, thank you, Alice Jean. Uh, the genre was LGP, uh, LGBTQ plus young adult. Amazing. Send it to me. <laughs> Here's your next one. An out of state plate is like a bullseye, my brother warned me. So, out of state here is functioning as an adjective. Uh, it's modifying the noun plate. And so, it also has to be hyphenated. There's a great um, guide to hyphenating adjectives in our favorite book, the Chicago Manual of Style. I should, I should permanently have this on my bookshop.org affiliate link because I have forced so many purchases of this book. Um, yes, but when we have um, certain adjectives uh, or when certain phrases become adjectives, they need hyphenation and this is one of them. Um, I take it the brother is a cop, but I don't know. I, I like this. I like that it's a, I, I like what this does. Um, I want a little more, but I feel like it's coming. It feels like stylistically uh, shorter, more direct sentences might be a hallmark in this book. And so I would let this pretty much stand as is. Cool. Uh, just to answer a question that's going around in the comments, I mentioned that we're gonna do a few of these for Instagram. Mm -hmm. uh, eventually they'll make their way to YouTube, but if you wanna be the first to catch them, then uh, IG is the way to go. Uh, at some point when I find the time, we'll get make it live on YouTube as well if you don't have Instagram. Uh, okay, uh, that one, um, sorry. Uh, oh dear, I've totally lost it. So you're so, multitasking, it's always yeah, risky. I've been multitasking, I can't do that, but uh, I think that's probably a thriller, it's pretty safe to say. Oh, well, I don't know, could be. It sounded like brotherly advice, I don't know. Uh, the future has no soundtrack yet semicolon. It's only an image in front of us projected on silver mist. Woo. Okay. So the yet here is not necessary. The future has no soundtrack is a lovely way to begin. It's only an image in front of us projected on silver mist. That you lose me there. Uh, part of the reason is because a soundtrack, you, you're starting to mix your metaphors, right? We're talking about a soundtrack and then all of a sudden see the future as an image. Uh, so I guess we're talking movies, right? Is that what's going on? That there's no, it's it's just images, there's no sound yet. But that has, I, I would have to unpack that really far to make it make sense. So I would say stick with the soundtrack, not, don't, don't jump ship on that idea. Um, and maybe just the future has no soundtrack is your opening line. Cool. Uh, that one uh, was from P. Graham Strong uh, and it's uh, literary fiction uh, slash commercial fiction. Uh, I've got one one or the other, not both, but fine. So uh, literary, I guess, <laughs> commercial fiction, what does that sort of normally suggest? Well, literary fiction is really about the author's relationship to language and uh, that's without, you know, sort of like going off on a major tangent, I will say that uh, if, you, if in writing your book, one of your goals was not the interrogation of language and form, you probably aren't writing literary fiction. That's Fair how enough. I feel. <laughs> That's my feeling about that. Everyone thinks writing literary fiction is so special and important, but it's really just another sort of way to categorize your writing style. So don't worry about that. Hmm. Okay, got one here now. Uh, this one uh, is from Neil, last name withheld. Okay. In his dozen years as a US postal worker, Ian Dobler had never seen a package as suspicious as the one he had just delivered to his own backyard. I love this. I think this is perfect. I would not change a thing. Um, I, I'm totally intrigued. I can't wait to find out what's in the box. Um, yeah, this was great. Perfect. Oh. Uh, yeah, that, uh, is into the adventure slash travel genre, uh, which I don't know to me always says nonfiction, but if this is like a nonfiction memoir -y type thing, perhaps 
Well, but adventure can also be, you know, there's, um, there's this great series by, I think, Mackenzie Lee. Um, it's, it, they're all, I'm going to mess up the titles, but it's like the, the gentleman's guide to vice and virtue and the ladies, it, you know, it's, it's a series, but those are adventure novels because the characters go on a, go on journeys. They go, the adventure is the thing. Um, so I don't know if this is, I, this, this feels like fiction to me, but uh, this one is from Mary Seyfert. Joey smelled trouble, and a Labrador knows what a Labrador's nose knows. <laughs> this is so sweet. Um, I hope this is a picture book or or uh, or middle grade, but it's quite uh, charming. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a, I think it's, it's a mystery, but it feels like it could be a cozy mystery, perhaps for adults. Yeah, for I don't know. It, it would. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay, look, I, Cozy Mystery is not a genre that I read and it's not a genre that I edit. So I don't know, um, I don't know what the conventions are there in terms of striking a specific tone. I'm very charmed by this. And so if that's what you author are going for, great job. It feels a little juvenile to me, but I don't know if that's, like maybe this is, maybe the first chapter or the prologue is from the dog's point of view and then the rest is from our, you know, salty detective. I, I don't know. Cool. Uh, thank you, uh, Mary, for sending that one in. Uh, if you're here, I uh, don't see you in the comments. Sorry about that. Next time, I'll definitely have all the titles. Uh, okay, here's our next one. We are in the business of lying to people. You could work in a lot of different industries, friend. I, okay, I, I guess the... Mm -hmm. I, I don't know what to do with this because it's not dialogue. And so I don't know if the whole thing is in this kind of second person space. What was that great novel? Um, about the office workers and the whole thing is told in these collective nouns. Does anybody in the, if you know what I'm, it's Joshua Ferris. Um, does anybody know the book I'm talking about? <laughs> Uh, it's a great book. It takes place in an office, and it's it's a wonderful book. But it, that's the only recent um, book I can think of that uses this uh, modality throughout. So I, I just don't know what to do with this uh, because that pronoun is throwing me off. So I think this could probably be stronger and more specific. We do want to start with character. If the character, if if the narrative voice is always going to be collective in this novel, that's an important signal. But since I don't know that, uh, this is a little hard to take it. Yeah. Well, potentially, if this is the start of a uh, like dialogue. Right. It could be, but then where's where our dialogue? You know, where are where are quotation marks? Yeah. Cool. I just learned uh, that book. Someone, look, someone, look it up for me. <laughs> Bright lights, big city. I'm pretty sure that's not it, right? No. Um. It's a. I, I'm picturing the book. It was, I think, yellow with white writing on it. Um, I'll look it up at the end while you're talking about stuff. Cool. All right. Thank you for that one. This one's from Stephanie Yates. D.I. Loveday Pengeli looked at the dead beaver on her desk and sighed. Dot, dot, dot. Well, first of all, there's no reason for an ellipsis at the end of this sentence. Be confident in the ends of things, please. Um, you know, ellipses are for when someone's voice travels. And for no other time, right? Uh, unless we're showing a hesitation. But this is a very clear end. She, she looks at the dead beaver on her desk and sighs. End the sentence. Um, D-I should have a period after both uh, letters. Um, but I would also start with Detective Inspector if this is the first time we're meeting someone. Um, the, the name Loveday Pengeli is absurd. Now, maybe that's <laughs> intentional, but it feels, I don't know, is this noir? I don't know if this is supposed to be very noir. Uh, it, it seems quite silly, so. I think it's, um, it, by the sounds of the description, it's actually a, a regional one. So I think it's set in Cornwall. Pengeli sounds like it could be a very Cornish kind of name. Okay, that is not something I would have known. Apologies. Um, you know, I'm interested. I want to know who put the beaver there and why. So, you know, good job. Um, the name of the 
uh, Joshua Ferris book, uh, some people come back with, Then We Came to the End. Yes, yes, that's what I was thinking of. Thank you Love so you. much. <laughs> but it's it's so it's so good. I mean, I hope that you're all talking about how much you loved it. Um, I I love that book. I the year I read it, I felt like it was one of the best books I read that year. So, um, again, uh, the the narrator there is anonymous and speaks for the whole office in a really interesting way. It's just a great book. It's a great book. Thank you. Uh, cool. Uh, we have our next one here from S. Simmon. Let's wait. Fiorel was born from his father's tears. Whew, how mythic. Um, neat. I'm interested. It doesn't feel like the end of the sentence. It feels like part of a sentence. Um, I'd like a little more here. You, you've certainly activated the character and some of the mythology, but you could probably put a comma after tears and give us a little bit more. And so that's what I, I want. I want more here, which is a good sign, right? You're off to a good start. Um, I want to know what kind of world or realm or story we're in, and, and I don't know that yet. So if you could give us a few more clues, that would be wonderful. Cool. Thank you. Uh, that was uh, S. Simon again. That was a fantasy slash YA. Great. Okay. Here's the next one that I know breaks one of your rules, but it could be an exception, I thought. Oh boy. <laughs> I woke to find myself in a narrow hospital bed, groggy with sleep or with drugs and needing to pee. It does not qualify for an exception. We will repeat after me, everyone, wherever you are, repeat after me. I will not begin a novel with my character waking up. Left a pause for you to just repeat that. <laughs> um, just fast forward five minutes something else. I mean, people always want an exception. What if my character's been in a coma for 20 years? Well, then they have nothing interesting going on because they've just been in a coma for 20 years. So, you know, I understand the moment of, of wakefulness seems like the obvious way to begin. And that's why we're not going to begin there. Okay. So just push this forward five minutes and tell me where we are. And that's the beginning of the novel. Okay. That was from uh, Deirdre or Didi. Uh, and the genre put down there was women's literary fiction, which probably isn't a thing for you. I don't know why only women would want to read it. I, it women's fiction is a, is about source of conflict, and literary fiction is about style. So, like, sure, sure, why not? Cool. Uh, I've got one here from Ava Monaghan. Olivia, alive, and her husband, Charles, dead, were on their way to Aylesworth Hall. <laughs> I don't, I don't know if that was supposed to be kind of a sensible chuckle line, but I found it really satisfying. Um, there are a lot of ways to skin this cat, right? There were a lot of ways that you could have worded this. And I think the way you chose um, is really charming and, and very stylistic. And I think this is wonderful. That's it. That's all I got. <laughs> I really like this one. Yeah, uh, it's uh, on the Gothic fiction, which I think fits quite nicely into that. Great. Uh, okay. Uh, here is uh, another one. If Callie had looked where she was going, she wouldn't have slipped on the golf ball, but she wouldn't have ended up with a jog either. Okay. This is an efficient, an efficient line, not an inefficient line. Um, it is not especially artful and it doesn't activate a lot of senses. So this is really telling, right? So depending on how close the narration gets, we could get in a little closer. Now, obviously it seems like the narration is about to back up and and bring us back to this moment of impact, so to speak, uh, which is which could be okay. So I, I would say this isn't the most compelling first line I've seen today, but it definitely heralds a certain style, which is to say, I'm going to tell you what happens and then I'm going to back it up and show you. It's hard to know how effective that is 
on a on a grander scale without seeing more. Um, so there's nothing wrong with this. Uh, some people would put a comma after dog, uh, which is not wrong, uh, but it's not necessarily required. So that would be my only grammatical feedback. This is okay. This is like a solid B for me. And I, you know, you know, I'm I'm always looking to hand out gold stars and A pluses. So this is a solid B for me. Uh, well, you heard it, Sue Crawford. Uh, that's a solid B for you. <laughs> Her genre is a uh, book club fiction. Which is that the same as I've heard people use upmarket. Upmarket, book. yeah, yeah, upmarket book club. Mm -hmm. It's like a, it's a, it's a more artful version, sort of, of commercial fiction. So commercial fiction uh, can sometimes refer to genre fiction. You know. Um, it's a really broad term. We don't need to get into that conversation now, but that's fine. Book club fiction, I'm here for it. Cool, thank you. Uh, next one here is from Gary Reed. Gary, let us know what this one's called. War had not broken out overnight. Reporter Jack O'Brien needed a story and wanted breakfast. Okay. I'm staring at that semicolon with like some questions. Semicolons are very powerful, right? They really indicate um, that our two sentences can't be understood in their fullness without one another. And so what I understand from that semicolon is that Jack thought war would have was going to be his story. And I'm really interested in that idea. So instead of relying on that semicolon to do all that work, I'd like you to re- write this sentence to tell me about the war Jack was expecting. You know, the war Jack had expected to break out overnight, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, and, and that right away tells me that he's experienced. It tells me that he's got a, a nose for news, that kind of thing. So I, I think this is an okay idea. You're relying way too much on that semicolon to fill in the blanks for us that you could fill in for us with actual language. Uh, great, thank you, thank you, Gary. Uh, that one's historical fiction, uh, set in the U.S. in the summer of 1939. Okay. I guess when the war broke out in Europe, but uh, but not the yeah. Some countries uh, sort of uh, sat around on the sidelines. <laughs> what? What are you talking about? Um, yeah. Um, this is from Kara Martin. Kara, let us know. Here we go. Yep, there it is. This isn't my story to tell, but Ronan Clark would never tell it. He barely admits it to himself. How many have we do we have we been tracking how many semicolons we've seen today? Um, I, I think um, a lot of people have caught on to the fact that you will cut them off at the at a with a when the period comes in. And so <laughs> everyone's got a semicolon happy. You guys are on to my game. Um, this isn't my story to tell, comma. But Ronan Clark would never tell it. The reason we need a comma before the conjunction, but is because Ronan Clark would never tell it is a com is a complete clause, right? Subject verb. Um, it's not a good sentence on its own, but it is there and it does qualify. So we need a comma before but. This isn't my story to tell, but Ronan Clark would never tell it. He barely admits it to himself. Now, I like this. I might even not mind the semicolon. Though maybe an M dash depends on the style on the rest of the work. You could also combine this, you know, but Ro this isn't my story to tell, but, but Ronan Clark would never. No, you couldn't combine it. Oh, you know, I'm going to say I would let this stand as is. I think it's probably fine, just like this. Uh -huh. Just add in that comma and you're good to go. All right. You heard it, Kara. Absolutely fine. Adult fiction. <laughs> Uh, okay, we've got the next one here. Uh, I won't tell you the author's name. You're not going to tell me the author's name? Why do I know the author? Mm, you probably can figure it out. Oh, uh -huh. <laughs> I hadn't read it yet. Okay, everyone just like, just forget the last five seconds happened. <laughs> my name is Gina Zamet, but for the first six days of my life, I was known as Kelly Woods. Well, that is extremely intriguing. And if this is a memoir, it's a great place to begin, and I think this is a great, it's a great hook. I'm hooked. Yep, uh, that is uh, Gina Zamet's memoir. Uh, fantastic, Gina. <laughs> Hitting the nail right on the head there. Good. <laughs> <laughs>
Cool. Uh, next one here is uh, from Brian Wells. I didn't receive a single compliment on my Italian leather shoes at my sister's funeral. So it almost feels too much like a poke in the ribs, right? So the, the effort to make the protagonist seem self-absorbed is almost too bald. Uh, and so I would probably save the reveal about the funeral to the end of the first paragraph. And I would let the reader believe, I would, I would let the reader wonder where, where the narrator is that he expected to receive compliments and only somewhere a few sentences in sort of reveal that it's a funeral. I think that would be funnier. Uh, and also really let us get absorbed in this person's self-obsession. So I, I, that is, that is what I recommend. Cool. Uh, it's a, the Italian leather, oh, I lost it. Uh, I think that one, oh, you're searching for the word Italian on my spreadsheet. Oh, a bunch of them. Uh, that was uh, Brian Wells' sci-fi crime uh, novel. So well, I did not see the sci-fi component coming, but we never know how much sci-fi, you know, sci-fi is very broad. So who knows? Whatever sci-fi universe this is, they still have shoes and they're still in Italy. <laughs> And and well, they might not be in Italy, but the the leather, there were Italy is still making great shoes. So yeah, and monstrously, we are still slaughtering animals in the clothing. <laughs> okay, so we can get we can get a lot about this world uh, just from one sentence. Yeah. Um, this one's from Leandre Larouche. Uh, the drive back to Canada this time was not a glorious return to the homeland. Okay, yeah, I dig it. I, uh, that this time feels a little awkward. Uh, and maybe some of you um, watching will agree with me here that the placement of that is a little strange. The drive back to Canada was not the glorious return to the homeland it usually was, or um, the drive back to Canada was not the glorious return to the homeland I expected it to be. You know, just that, <laughs> suck that this time right out of there and find another way to cue what you are trying to tell us, which is that this is a, a drive that's been made. It's a journey that's been made more than once. Um, just find a better way to fit that in there because fitting it in here is, is really um, it's just a little, doesn't belong there. It's a, it's a square piece round hole kind of thing. I'm not into it. Cool. Uh, thank you, Leandre. Uh, there was a, a thriller. Okay. All right. Oops. I just corrected a quick typo that was introduced into this. Uh, thank you. Uh, one more. Here we go. I was prim is back there. If any of you are wondering where the cat is, she's she's like comatose in her giant cat tree. I was trying to see if she was going to join us. Um, I had a natural talent nurtured since birth by my father for studying men with an innocent and admiring gaze. So this is ambiguous because what I'm trying to figure out is, is the natural talent for studying men whose gazes are innocent and admiring, or is it a natural talent for looking at men with, as the looker, an innocent and admiring gaze. So this is, yeah, leave it up there. I gotta, I gotta splice this. I had a natural talent nurture since it's also very creepy that this idea that studying men with an innocent and admiring gaze is a, is a number one, a talent and that the talent is nurtured by this person's father. I have many concerns here uh, and the ambiguity isn't helping. So I would really get concise about what the talent is. Um, yeah, I think it's the former. I think it's that the talent belongs, or I think it's the latter. I think it's that the talent belongs to the speaker and that the gaze belongs to the speaker, right? The talent is the gaze. But I, I this honestly creeps me out a little bit. I, I don't, no thanks. Cool, thanks Edie uh, for sending in the first line from your memoir. 
Uh, next one coming up. Uh, this one is from Trini Fung. The alarm in the kitchen blared, a signal for silence and a reminder that it was time to listen. The alarm in the kitchen, huh? When I think about kitchen alarms, I think about smoke detectors. So it's a little confusing that an alarm in a kitchen would be a signal for silence and a time to listen. Is this uh, is this sci-fi by any chance? Yeah, it's a young adult, young adult dystopian. Yeah, I was. That's that was my next. The next words out of my mouth were. It feels like it's probably a YA dystopia. Um, feels like a signal for silence and a reminder that it's time to listen are the same thing. So I'm interested, but this feels a little clunky. And I would maybe be more embodied here. So, um, you know, my hands, like show me that someone, our, our protagonist is sort of like chopping vegetables and then, you know, stops and like places her hands on the table or something. Or show me how she listens or comes to attention instead of just telling me about the alarm. Maybe try that. Cool. Thank you for that one. Uh, tree, uh, okay. We're going to try to do a couple more. I know it's coming up to the hour, but I think we can probably squeeze in like three or four more. Uh, and then I've got a few things to share with everyone before uh, we all disappear into the afternoon or the night. Uh, this one is from Jim Sack. I wish I was more like Gordon. Okay. You know, this kind of line doesn't give us anywhere to go. And depending on who or what Gordon is, was, might change to were. The conditional tense changes based on the likelihood of the thing being wished for. Isn't that strange? English is so weird. Um, if Gordon is another person, uh, then I believe you keep was as it's written, but was changes to were in the conditional when the stated desire is unlikely. I I could be confusing that. It's obviously a totally convoluted rule of English, but uh, this doesn't give us anywhere to go. I want to know who the character is before I want to know who they wish to be, especially when the person they wish to be doesn't have any context. This is uh, from Jim's uh, children's chapter book. So I guess that's intended at readers about five to seven, maybe. I have a five to seven year old reader and um, it doesn't change my opinion about this at all. All right, Jim, you heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> I have, my son is an avid reader and we read everything together and, and um, you know, his stuff is, it's pretty legit. It's pretty narrative and complex. And, and I would say you can challenge those readers. Don't, don't think about dumbing down for young readers. They can absolutely come up to the bar you set. Okay, uh, this one is uh, from Mustafa. Mustafa, thanks for sending that in. Uh, here we go. When the sun embraced the horizon, they entered the city. So I would switch these around. Um, they entered the city when the sun embraced the horizon. Uh, not because we always need our independent clause before our dependent clause, but because in this case, we want to center the subject at the start of the action. Um, again, activate setting more than character. So I'd like to see more character work here. Uh, and is it a is it a sort of sneaky clandestine entry into the city? Um, is it a bold entrance? Are they part of a parade? Um, I'm just not sure exactly what's going on here. So this doesn't do enough. Uh, again, more more heavy lifting here. We need more. Cool. Thank you. Uh, that was a, a YA fantasy. Thank you, Mustafa, for sending that one in. Uh, just do a couple more. This one I've been keeping for a while because I think it requires a, a little bit of untangling. Uh, but it's from Maximo Mayo, which I, if it's a real name, that's awesome. School isn't for everyone, especially for those whose age is the same number as their alleged murders, in my case being 17. Okay, first of all, that semicolon does not belong there. That should be a comma. Um, semicolons are used to connect two complete sentences, or they're used to connect two contrasting sentences, but still complete, or they're used to separate complex items in series, meaning um, items in a list that contain commas within each item. So. This does not qualify for any of those things. Therefore, school isn't for everyone, comma, especially 
those, not for those, because you already have for everyone. So you're just applying that forward. School isn't for everyone, comma, especially those whose age is the same number as their alleged murders. The wording on this is so convoluted. And I know what you're trying to say, which is that this 17 year old person has killed 17 people. It's not coming out right. It's just, it, it's coming out like this. It's just, it's very garbled. So don't be so precious and cute about it. Find a way to get us the information we need in a really clear, concise way. Uh, and and then move on from there. Don't, this is too like, it's too much mental gymnastics to get to this very sort of simple fact, which is that this young person has killed a lot of people. Cool. I also just sidebar, I'm not wild about murderers in schools. Not gonna lie, if I were an agent, this would stop me in my tracks. Um, just not interested in kids who kill people, hopefully not other kids. This is a no, this is a big, this is a big red flag for me. Cool. Uh, also, uh, Maximum has put the genre is fantasy slash mystery slash adventure slash action. Do those feel a bit overloaded or a bit sort of? Yeah, that's a hard pass. Uh, no, you have to pick one. Uh, maybe you get one in a subgenre, but like just because there's action doesn't mean it's an action novel. Just because there's you know, a mystery, there's there's a mystery in the at the heart of every novel. So just because there's some unknown aspects of your novel doesn't mean that it's a mystery. Um, to define your genre, you want to look at the at the setting and the, and the conflict in your book. Uh, and so you have to give a little bit more thought to refining those ideas. There's obviously a lot of ideas present here, and they all need some shaping. So I still feel like we're in big slab of marble phase, not fine sculpture phase. Cool. Uh, so give me a second here. Uh, Cool, thanks for sending that. Uh, and then we're just gonna do just one more from Jared Watson, but please stick around. I've got a few things I think that everyone will like, but here's our last one. All eyes followed Kenya King as she walked down the aisle of the school bus searching for a seat. Okay. Um, I am more interested in Kenya's POV than in wherever this narration is coming from. So you've give, you, you've put us, we're sitting with the all eyes, we're watching instead of walking. And I might be more interested in Kenya's experience of being watched, right? So let's center our subjects in the action instead of observing our subjects from a distance, right? So get, get in there, try to embody your text uh, within your subjects when possible. I, I would have a lot of questions about, um, you know, the, the narrative mode for this whole piece. Uh, but I, right now I'm, I'm always more interested in the feeling of the person being, I'm often more interested in the feelings of the person being watched than in, um, than in being one of many watchers. Uh, this one from Jared is a, a YA ages 12 to 18. Cause I think one of the things we've always heard is that I think when you're writing you know, YA, you're writing for ideally like 15, 16, or like 16, 17, 18, right? Well, depends, right? Like, so our advanced readers are are hitting these books at 13, 12, whatever. I mean, like um, a, but generally a 12 year old and an 18 year old are not reading the same thing, right? 12 is upper middle grade. So there's no range where you're writing for a 12 year old and an 18 year old at the same time. They have completely different values and life experiences. I mean, we're talking about potentially prepubescent and like about to step off into the world in college. Like these, these people really decide who your audience is and that might help you help guide you. This feels young to me. I mean, we're talking about getting on a school bus. So I would say this is probably upper middle grade. Cool. Uh, I'm gonna bring myself back on here for a second. Welcome back. Welcome back to the world of living. Thank you. That's amazing. Uh, I can't. I can't see how many we actually went through. I'm pretty sure they are good. A lot uh, for sticking around and for sending in so many great first lines. As we mentioned, we'll be doing a few more of these in the coming weeks. We're going to send them on to Instagram first of all. So, uh, if you want to be in the exclusive club of people who see it first, uh, just head to our description and follow us on Instagram. Uh, we'll post it up on there. Uh, you can watch it on your phone while you're driving or something. Um, also, we have a few more things to talk about. Uh, Becca, of course, is an editor over here at Readsy. I'm going to post uh, her link 
uh, in the comments here. Becca, uh, uh, what sort of what sort of project are you looking for uh, these days? Thanks for asking. Um, you know, a lot of what I I read, what I like to edit, right? So when I was giving recommendations, I focused on romance, literary fiction, um, commercial fiction, uh, and some fantasy. So I don't do a ton of high fantasy. I, I don't do really any high fantasy anymore. Um, so urban fantasy, you know, fantasy rooted in our world, and some light sci-fi, meaning um, science-based sci-fi, not like I'm talking wormholes, not alien meetings, right? That kind of thing. Uh, but really romance, literature, uh, I don't do much nonfiction, unfortunately. I just don't have room. Uh, and there are more qualified people than me to do nonfiction. So um, if you come to me with uh, a project on Reedsy and I'm not the right editor, I know a lot of great readers on a lot of great editors on Reedsy, and I will often give you a referral um, to somebody else on the platform who can help. So uh, do I only work with finalized manuscripts? So no manuscript is final. I want you to come to me when you think your manuscript is as good as it can be, uh, and we will make sure that it's the absolute best. So I don't really want to see your first drafts. Um, they just require a little bit more time and polish before bringing in an editor is a good idea. So. I don't work on partials, if that's the question. You know, I'm not going to look at your first 50 pages, and I'm not going to look at, you know, the 30,000 words you're hoping to turn into an 80,000 word novel. Uh, but I, I'm really interested in seeing your thoughtful uh, subsequent drafts. Cool. Uh, I've got a few things to plug myself. I'm dropping a link to our Eventbrite page. Uh, we've got two more events lined up imminently. Uh, one of them in two weeks' time is uh, a logline workshop. Uh, Jeff Lyons, who's one of our developmental guys, he works on a lot of story structure things. Uh, what you could do for that one is similar to this, you could submit a, a pitch for your book, an idea, your elevator pitch, uh, and then we're gonna bring on a few people onto our actual uh, webinar. Hey, a cat. Uh, we're gonna bring some people on live just as me and Becca are right now, and Jeff is going to have a chat with them and help them work through um, like a lot one, a simple pitch, a little a spine that will help you uh, develop your book and sell it. And then two weeks after that, uh, if anyone out there is a children's author, we're getting uh, Leo Harsis, who's an illustrator based in Cornwall, home to the Dead Beaver, um, the Dead Beaver mystery. <laughs> uh, he's going to be joining us, and he'll be doing some live illustrations. Uh, quite a series. Um, for that one, you can submit uh, a pitch. Was it submit the pitch for your book along with your first page, and he'll actually work up some concepts uh, if yours gets picked. Uh, I suspect there'll be probably quite a lot of submissions, so not everyone will get picked, but if you're a children's author uh, or an aspiring one, then that's a great thing to watch. You'll be able to see how illustrators uh, work with uh, authors and all that. Uh, okay, I think I've sort of shared everything uh, we need. Uh, you can find out more about us in the comments below. Uh, reminder again to follow us on Instagram to see a few more of these videos in a couple of weeks. If yours wasn't picked, maybe they'll turn up in uh, one of those videos. Thank you so much. It's been great uh, having you, Becca. Uh, will you Thanks do this for having me. On now? Well, uh, did you ask if I would do it again? Yeah. Of course I will. Excellent. I it's great. And also, I would just say to people, um, we do these about every other month, but I also run First Line Frenzy as a sort of hashtag party on Twitter. Uh, those are usually in the evening, Eastern Standard Time, usually 8 p.m. Uh, around the middle of the week. And uh, we go for an hour, and sometimes I bring in an editor pal, uh, and we provide joint critiques. So if you're interested, um, you can find me on Twitter, and my handle is at rfaitheditorial, uh, which we'll probably put in the comments or something. And uh, you can definitely keep an eye on that if you'd like to participate. Um, I pretty much get to every single person who submits a line on the Twitter First Line Frenzy because those are smaller groups. Um, so definitely worth keeping an eye on. Well, you're now asking for it because uh, there's still- I know, now there's gonna be like a thousand people on there, I'm sorry. Um, if I write a comment, you know, I'm not allowed to write a comment, okay? I was gonna put my Twitter handle in there, but I don't know how. Uh, I've just put your Twitter, uh, Thank Twitter you. comments. And someone's asked for the link uh, to the book list again posted that one. Yeah, do help us uh, black out the bestsellers list. Uh, it'd be amazing if we can uh, all be in the same boat for this one. I would love that. And I'll give you an update next time about how much money uh, we end up donating to Black Visions Collective based on the sales from that affiliate book link. So I really would love to give uh, you all a spectacular update next time. Amazing. Cool. Uh, yep. If you uh, miss some of this, you can always uh, wind back to the beginning of this webinar uh, as soon as this is done. Uh, what's the cat's name again? 
This is Primrose Everkitten. Excellent. Most excellent. All right. Uh, thanks, Becky.